Season 1 of Off the Dribble, the Byron Scott Podcast is brought to you by Nep Faka. Well, hello there. It's just me and the world's best tasting vodka. All right, all right. What's up, guys? This is your boy B. Scott with Off the Dribble with Byron Scott. I am here with another one of my favorite people in the world, man. And I'm going to just tell y'all a little bit about this man's uh, accomplishment. He was at the University of North Carolina, you know, them Tar Heels. And he went up there, you know, played there for three years, won a a national championship, got player of the year as well. He played with a couple of guys y'all might Y'all might remember one named Sam Perkins, who we used to call Smooth. Smooth Sam. And the other one, Michael Jeffrey Jordan, who is considered one of the greatest players of all time. Uh, He took his talents to Los Angeles as he was drafted um, first in the the NBA draft that year and uh, ended up being a seven-time All-Star, a three-time NBA champion, Hall of Famer, uh, 88 Finals MVP, with a triple double that game against the Detroit Pistons. Got the nickname for damn good reason, Big Game James. If y'all don't know who I'm talking about now, something wrong with y'all. I don't even talk about my man, James Worthy. Clever, welcome to the show. B. Scott, what's up? Class of 79. <laughs> That's where I first met you. Yes. Class of 79. I think it was uh, McDonald's, McDonald's High All School, American game. All, All That's American. Right. That's it. That's and here right. we are now. And look at us now. What is, what is that? 40 something years later, Clever, <sighs> we still kicking it. Don't remind still, me. I know, huh? Still, but you know what? In in, in commemorance of this day, Clever, I got to give you this. Uh, man, I've this, been, this is I've a been, nice little bottle. I'm, is it's, this yours, B? It, this is not mine. I'm, it's called Cigar. Okay. And, and it's a nice little red wine. So I want us to just have a little toast here this you know, is... for all those great years that we spent together, <clears throat> uh, those three championships that we won together. All the fun that we didn't had together. That's right. You know, and, uh, and, to my, and, to and my all boy. the uh, and all of the future success we go have together. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'll drink to that, brother. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, that's pretty good. Yes, it is. Club. I had your boy Cooper Loop on here, and Coop said, "Well, B, I really don't drink wine." And I, by the end of the show, he was like, "I, I think you didn't got me on to something here, <laughs> B." I'm, uh, and I got it, and I gave him a bottle of Camus. We drunk it all the uh, way down about right there, and I said, Coop, go ahead and take the rest of this if home. If you bro. don't drink wine, if you have a glass of Camus, you will become a wino. <laughs> I can't believe Coop don't drink wine. I, mean, I, I couldn't te- believe it either. Tequila but, back in the day. That yeah, was his thing yeah, back oh, in the day, but he, I guess he, we are. Uh, he drunk like, but you know, we, yeah, all, we all grow yeah, and, and move on. But move on. I, I think he's going to be stuck on wine now, Clever. I, yeah. After that time, he's going to be stuck on a little wine now. Uh, uh, Clever, I want to go back a little bit. You know, we, we know how great you, you were in, in college. You know how uh, successful your team was. We know the guys you had on that team. I, I didn't even mention Jimmy Black, who was one of the best point guards in yeah. college basketball at the time. Uh, you guys went on to beat Georgetown, who had another guy that was pretty damn good named mm-hmm. Patrick Ewing. Yeah. And I remember this play like it was yesterday. I can't remember the, the young man that had the ball in his hand. Freddie Brown. Freddie Brown. So Freddie yeah. Brown has the ball. He pump fake. You went for the fake. That's right. You were trying to get a steal. That's and right. You basically was out of the play. He turned back around and then threw it to you. And Be- you dribbled down the court and, and tried to really dribble it out and got fouled. So tell me, tell me, because you was out of you were definitely out of the out of the play at that time. So tell me what happened, Clever. Everywhere I go, people always say, Man, what great defensive play at the end of that Georgetown <laughs> game. And I just take the credit for it. I don't, I don't really tell them that I committed. <laughs> the cardinal sin. I mean, fate. coaches cannot <laughs> stand for a player to go for a steal unless he's going to get it. Right, right. So, but uh, Fred Brown, he had the ball, and you know, the another cardinal sin is to not pick up your dribble right. unless you have somewhere to pass it. So, right. anyway, uh, Byron, I, I went for that pump fake, and I jumped so far out into the passing lane. And the referee was counting down, 1,001, 1,002. He had to get rid of it in right, five seconds. Right, That his peripheral vision actually thought I was one of his teammates. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're playing down in New Orleans in the Dome, and everything was an echo. Everything was like a delayed echo. So when he threw me the ball, I froze like a deer in headlights because I didn't know what was going on. And then the only thing I could do was dribble out. Right, right, right. And uh, that was the end of that. I mean, I, I probably could have gone for a layup. And, uh, you know, poor Fred Brown. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you another yeah. story. 
uh, uh, I'm playing with the Lakers the next year. And as you know, a lot of times we stayed right at Arlington, Virginia, right, right, right. across the bridge from Georgetown. Right. And so we practiced at Georgetown. At Georgetown yeah. the very next year, my rookie year. So I walk into, they have a, a, a small gymnasium. I walk in, the swinging doors, and I run right into Fred Brown. <laughs> and he had, he has yet to get over that. You know, the people just wouldn't let him uh, get over that. But uh, yeah, that was some bad defense, but ended up successful on, on our end. Yeah, I, I feel bad for Fred Brown as well. I, I don't think a lot of people remember, Clever, your, your rookie year, you were having an unbelievable se season. Good year. And you come down, I don't know if it was against Phoenix, but I remember watching this on TV. You come yeah. down, you break your leg. Yeah. Your season's over. I mean, how did you feel at that time? Because at that time, like I said, you were playing extremely well. Yeah. And you were the new kid on the block. How did you feel? I, I was a new kid on the block, uh, Byron. And, you know, I, I came into the Lakers, you know, uh, confident, uh, not arrogant. I thought I could start, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I came in the training camp and I looked around and I saw Kurt Rambis. <laughs> and I said, I can get that damn spot right there. But <laughs> but but Kurt showed me what a power forward was in the NBA. But getting back to your story, uh, yeah, I, I had just started to jail mm -hmm. with Magic and you know Kareem. And Norm Nixon was mm -hmm. was on the team then. We we were a fast break team, and I remember going up for an offensive rebound. It was one of those where I kind of took off and just jumped in the air, and I got a little shove, and I can't remember who it was, and I came down and I hyperextended my my leg and I broke it. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about a young fella, you know, uh first year, getting ready to go into the playoffs. It just broke my heart. Man. Yeah. Because I'd never, you know, I'd broken my ankle in college, but I just I was just devastated because, you know, I was I was finally starting to play yeah, well, yeah. get used to the system in the NBA, had made it past that 35, 40 game mark. Um and it was tough yeah. mentally. Yeah. And, you know, if it hadn't been for, uh, and you remember, uh, if it hadn't been for Clive Brewster. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think I would have oh, really, yeah. you know, because it was a lot of it was a lot of rehabilitation. They put a couple of screws in my leg. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to come back quite as quick. I uh, wasn't able to play. I picked up about 10, 15 pounds. It was just, it was just tough, yeah. you know, being in the NBA and being injured. But, you know, I had some good support. Um you know, over Carol and Job came back. I was young, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so uh, you know, I think I, the the youth, you know, helped me, you know, heal quicker. So from that point, you know, I came back, tested the leg out, and you know, it was still good, and no looking back yeah. after that. Clive Bruce, y'all don't know, but <laughs> I, I'm telling you, this dude, one of the best uh, PTs ever that I've seen. You know, physical therapist. Yeah. I mean, when you when you got hurt, they sent us to him. And this man, first of all, if you wasn't willing to work, he ain't yeah. gonna mess with you. Yeah. Clyde wasn't one of them dudes that's gonna be sitting there talking about, come on, come on. Clyde yeah. would be like, he don't wanna work. That was yeah. remember, he just yeah. look at you and say, do you, you, you wanna work or not? If you be like playing around, he just say, he don't wanna work and he just leave you yeah. alone. So yeah. I remember Clive because of my hamstring having, to, having yeah. to deal with Clive as well. So now we go to your second year. And like you said, your first year, you were playing so well, and you were playing in front of another guy, or playing with another guy, and, and this is the reason I'm getting to the second year, because they made this trade to make room for you to be that small, that, that starting small forward, and they traded a guy who was pretty popular, who had a great career himself, in Jamal Silkman Wilkes. Yeah. They traded him to the Clippers. I get drafted that year by the Clippers, traded to the Lakers. Right. So I'm on the team my rookie year with you, your, your second year, basically, uh, and now you're in that starting role, and we go to the NBA Finals. Tell us how that felt for you, you know, going to the Finals, basically really your first year because you got hurt, you know, yeah. so you had to kind of go through that. But your second year in your league, you were one of the best teams in the, in, the, in, the, in the world, and we get to the NBA Finals. Tell me how you felt about that. Yeah, I mean, we were good, you know, and I, I was a rookie in the Finals. Yeah. You know, even yeah. though it was my second year, I was a rookie in the Finals, and I had no idea, um, you know, what to, what to expect. You know, mm -hmm. never played a playoff game. So we're starting out uh, on, on on the West Coast. I think it's Denver, Phoenix, and someone else. And we finally uh, get to Boston. And I'm like, I'm like a kid in the candy yeah, store. I, yeah. I, I've, I'm, I've yet to realize what a seven-game series is like. 
uh, especially playing against the Boston Celtics. Right. Uh, I knew a little bit about the history mm-hmm. with Wilt and Jerry West right. and Elgin Baylor right. and all the losses and, and the way the, the Celtics dominated. But it, but it didn't really hit me until 1984 when we got to Boston. Yeah. And the nostalgia of the city and the fans and all the – you know, all the, you know, you remember the fire alarms mm-hmm. at 2 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> all the prank calls, and then and then the physical play, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. taking Kurt Rambis out. Um, but I, you know, I felt, I felt good, and at the same time, I was a little bit nervous. Mm-hmm. I had never been in a, in, a, in a competition so fierce and so intense and so physical, and then the media – was you know you were you were under the microscope yeah, so oh yeah. if 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 you were young and had never experienced that before you know you had a little jitters but on the floor you know it it was all good you know we won game 1 mm-hmm. uh which was a big plus for us mm-hmm. and uh that's that's pretty much was our goal but we had game 2 wrapped up mm-hmm. Kevin McHale missed a couple free throws and at the time I think it was uh, some discussion on whether to call a timeout or whether to try to get it in really quickly. And Magic Johnson grabbed it and threw it to me, and I was I was nervous as a scarecrow, you know, because <laughs> here we are, 13 seconds away from winning Game Two. I'm in the back court. I I, I I need to get rid of it. I didn't even look nor think. I just took it and I tried to throw a, a, a errant pass. To you, you were way yep. out of the play. Yep. And yep. Gerald Henderson was just licking his chops. Like, <laughs> Laying in the cut. <laughs> and and uh B, to this day, man, I wake up at nights with a sweat because he went up for that layup. And I can just still yeah. I can still feel the, yeah. the, the leather just go over my hand. But uh that was our four, fourth championship. Uh, and I always say that was our fourth one. Mm-hmm. It just didn't came up short. We had a chance to win in game seven, but I still think that game two. Uh, was the one so it was it was um it was exciting at first it was nerve wracking in the middle i mean like it was like losing like your marbles when you're a kid you yeah, know yeah and then you learn from it right you right. know i i looked at magic watched how he handled it i looked at kareem i listened to pat rally had bob mcadoo in my ear yeah, yeah, you know and yeah. so all that all that uh you know, that disappointment built up a lot of uh, incentive and a lot of energy wanting to get back and, you know, wanting to redeem something that you knew you shouldn't have lost. So, yeah. so it was it was it was a painful year and a, and a learning year at the same time. Yeah. You know, the crazy thing is you mentioned something that a lot of people don't know is that, you know, the, the Celtics had so many antics you know we, we're staying in the hotel like you said and we getting calls at two three in the morning with these alarms going off telling everybody they had to come downstairs come out the lobby you know so we get up we had to come downstairs in the lobby the yeah. false alarm we go back up you know 30 minutes later another another one goes off yeah. you know people calling your room and asking for tickets and then when you was like i ain't got no tickets they cuss you out and you know larry bird's gonna yeah. kick your ass i mean they, they doing all this stuff all throughout the playoffs when we were in boston you know so I remember that pass too, clever because I was going the other way, and then I saw the ball coming. I was like, "Oh, sh-. you know." Oh, and I no. tried to reach back, and no, no. and Gerald got it. But the thing that I remember the most was after that how we were in the locker room, and we were all just sitting there, and we were dejected from losing that game. And then I remember our pitcher losing Game Seven. Yeah. But I also knew I was like, "Boy, you know, we're gonna come back with a vengeance." Yeah. No doubt. In '85, you know, we we became the first Laker team ever to beat a Celtic team in a, in a seven-game series. So we got that monkey off of Jerry's back, mm-hmm. you know, Elgin's back, Wilt's back. But the biggest thing is you came out and you you dominated. And and I'm, I'm going to go back just a little bit because the small forward position in the NBA at that time was always guys six 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 seven. Mm-hmm. That was about it, small forward. That's what they called them, you know. You know, shooting guard 6'4", point guard's supposed to be six one six two. Magic, you know, messed that up and changed the whole thing <laughs> to 6'9", you know, just revolutionized that position. And, and I'm I'm here to say that James Worthy kind of revolutionized that that small four position. If you look at Dr. J, six six, you know that was the normal size of a of a small forward. James Worthy at six nine was able to get up and down the floor, take people off the dribble from the perimeter, and post you up. 
So he he gave so many problems to these guys. Kevin McHale couldn't do nothing, which I remember that in 85. It was like you were on a mission. So did you take that game to, you know, in that loss in 84 and use that as your motivating factor for 85? It's still my motivation, Byron. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm one, 130 yards out with a red flag. I'm thinking about that damn pass. I'm like, I'm going to redeem myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all learn from our, you know, from from our losses and from our mistakes. And I just knew that, you know, uh, coming back in 85, um, knowing the history, you know, Jerry West never went back to the Boston Guard. He yeah. just couldn't take it. Yeah. And, you know, we came back in 85. We were on a mission. Uh, I'm sure you're going to talk about that game one. Uh, oh, we, yeah. we lost that game one. They call it the Boston Massacre. Mm -hmm. But even after that loss, I still felt like, you know, we, we had them. We, we were going to come back and win. Yeah. You know, I had Cap on and we talked about the Memorial Day Massacre as mm -hmm. well and how, you know, how they were throwing dirt on his face after game one because Parrish was beating him up and down the floor. Yeah. And then Red Arbeck made that statement. The reason we can beat the Lakers because we mm -hmm. don't have to double team Kareem. Mm -hmm. We don't have mm -hmm. to double team James Worthy and all this stuff. So Cap came back with vengeance, you know, in in, in that series. Uh, the, the next five games, it wasn't even close, to be honest with you. You play unbelievable. And basically, you know, the rest of us, you know, Magic did what he you know normally does. You know, he's going to get yeah. his 18, 19, 20 points, 14, 15 assists, going to get his boards. And the rest of us just kept chipping in and just on the defensive end, making sure we we held our guys in check. You know, so I thought at that time, Clever, in 85, it, it was almost like your coming out party. You was basically like in that finals, like, I'm here. You know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a new small forward, you know, uh, on the horizon, and his name is James Worthy. Well, yeah, you know, after you after you go through a disappointing year, and then you you got to listen to Cedric Maxwell, <laughs> and talking ML all Carr, the time, you know, waving the towel. I, I also I also went to uh, because my outside shot wasn't always there in '84, so I also I went to Pete Knowles' camp, yeah, big yeah, man's camp, yep. You know, spent a summer with Kiki Vandeweghe and Alex Eames, and picked up some stuff. So yeah, I I felt like you know. Kareem still had it, but I knew he and Kareem had been carrying this squad throughout mm -hmm. the 80s. And I was like, okay, I got to chip in and at least stop being so deferent and mm -hmm. deferring to them all the time. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, playing the Celtics, what they had done to us the year before, right. I wanted that ass. Yeah. I wanted them. I wanted them bad. Cedric, you and me both. I wanted them bad. Ooh, and, you, you know, and we, me both. We, we, we played well, man. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, I, I recall you having a good year, shooting some big shots. You know, uh, Mitch Kupchak came in off yep, the bench. We yep. needed to play Larry big. Spriggs, play two big. or three minutes. Y'all want to get physical? Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. Uh, let's get physical. And yeah. we did. And uh, so that that was the the first time that, like you said, anyone's ever beaten the Celtics right. in a seven-game series and the first time that anyone's ever won on that parquet floor. Oh, yeah. It, it, was, it was a great fit. Yeah. And, and we stayed there and partied yes. in, in Boston after the win, you know, Riles come out with his tux on. We yeah, got a ballroom. We got food and yeah. everything. We got music. We just had a party in their city. And that, that's what I felt so good about. And the fact that I remember my dad was taking me to the airport. And my dad was like, ah, so what do you think? I said, about what? He said, well, you got game six and seven back there in Boston. You think you guys going to do it in seven? I said, Pops, we're going to win in six. Mm -hmm. And so when we won and we came home, he 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 was – Honest, honest as he can be with me, said, you know what? You said it with so much confidence and conviction. Yeah, right. He said, I thought it was going to go seven. I thought y'all yeah. would win, but I thought, I said, no, no. We, we knew we were going to go there to whoop their tail, and that's exactly what we did. Couldn't let it go to seven. No. Uh, that would have been, you know, uh, odds against us in the Boston Garden. So we knew we were a better team. Uh, they shouldn't have beat us in, in, in 84. 84. We should have had absolutely. You know, three championships uh, against them. But we were very confident. Um and, you know, I thought Kareem, Oof. you know, uh, I never got to see him play in college. But in that game, two in, in 85, that's what it looked like. Oh, he man. looked like he was like 23. And all he left was people with their mouths open. They're like, they couldn't believe yeah, that yeah. an elderly statesman was 37 was was getting busy. Yeah, 37. Yeah. Oldest player still to this day to be yeah. named MVP in the championship series. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people just have not seen 
Kareem's full body of work. Right. When you talk about that's why I think you have to go decade to decade. You want to talk about who the best player is in your decade? That's fine. But when you talk about the best ever, if you haven't seen his full body of work, I, I can I can understand why some of the young voters right. and some of the young right. writers, but he's 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 still the man. He's still the man. I remember he hit that one three. Was it in Chicago? Yeah, it was in Phoenix. In Phoenix. <laughs> Phoenix. Yeah, it was only three. I talked to him about that too. I said, you've done everything on the basketball court. And then you stepped out with yeah. a loose ball, caught it in Phoenix, turned around and shot a three. So you was able to accomplish that goal as well. People talk about, uh, yeah, Kareem couldn't shoot the three. He was like, he didn't have to, he didn't but have he to. showed you he could if he had yeah. to. Yeah. The one thing I always say when we when we talk about comparisons on on who's the greatest ever, and you and I think you just said it, Club, is you got to take the full body of work. You got to look at what he did in high school. He lost two games in high yeah. school. Yeah. You look what he did in college. He lost one game in college. Yeah. You know, and then he gets to the pros. He wins six MVPs, six championships. If you look at all the body of work, there, there's not a greater player. And no. you know, obviously, you know, dis no disrespect to our boy MJ because no. he is definitely in that Mount Rushmore of great players. Yep. But Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, whatever what, what he was able to accomplish, high school, college, and pros will probably never be done again. I mean, the freshman team at UCLA. Beat the varsity team. That, that's when that's when freshmen couldn't play varsity. Right, and they the varsity team and the varsity team was ranked number one in the country. Yeah, they won a national championship. <laughs> they changed that immediately. Yeah, uh, and the discipline, uh, the yoga, uh, yeah. the meditation. Uh, you know, Kareem went through a few decades. You know, Nate Thurman to this day, mm -hmm. Kareem said was the best defensive player mm -hmm. ever. Wes Unsell. Then he goes through Patrick Ewan and Elijah Wan and keeps yeah, moving. Yeah. So he went through about five decades of some of the best centers and survived till the end. So you and say what you want, but he, he gets my vote. Today's episode of Off the Dribble, the Byron Scott podcast, is brought to you by Mission Muay Thai. Mission is an authentic Muay Thai training facility in Long Beach, California. Focusing on traditional Muay Thai arts for professional combat sports, self-defense, and fitness for youth and adults. Take advantage of the $10 intro class promo by registering on the website or download Mission Muay Thai app. Visit missionmuaythai.com for more information. He was weighing them out. Yes, hey, Clever, so, so we win it in 85. And this is just my thinking when we get to 86, because we, we, we had a really good year in 86. Yeah. We get to the Western Conference Finals. Uh, we play against the, the upcoming Houston Rockets mm -hmm. with Ralph Sampson and uh, Akeem Olajuwon, who you just mentioned. And, and I just thought we had a better team, but I thought we were kind of like that fat cat. You know, we had accomplished yeah. so much. So we, we we really didn't take them that serious yeah. until we got down 3-2 and we was like, oh, shit, these guys, <laughs> you yeah. know, we got to start playing, you know. And that's just my take. I, I wonder what's your take on it. My take on it that the – I remember in, in 84, I think it was maybe my rookie year, maybe it was 84, we played the Celtics four times in preseason. That's mm -hmm. when Commissioner Stern. That was, was that my your rookie second year. year? That was okay. my rookie year, your second year. That's when year. Commissioner yeah. Stern was starting to roll that. Then CBS, we got the big contract with CBS, and Commissioner Stern was on to something. Uh, Larry Bird, Magic on the West Coast. So that Boston rivalry, had gotten so big mm -hmm. and everybody expected the Lakers and the Celtics to be in the finals. And so 84, 85. And so we're going to, we're going to redeem ourselves from, from 84 and get them in 86. That's all we're thinking about. That's right. all I was thinking about. Right. right. I was thinking about, we're going to get through the Western conference like we usually do. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to the Celtics. And I think that's where, I, I think that's where my mindset was. And meanwhile, um, I think Fitch was the coach at the time. Mm -hmm. He had conjured up uh, a pretty good freaking team down there with <laughs> Akeem Olajuwon, which was just amazing. Yes. But Robert Reed, a 6'8 point guard, uh, uh, Rodney McCray, who mm -hmm. played me very well. Then they had Wiggins, uh, Lord, they ran like we did. Mm -hmm. And they had Ralph Sampson, who, who wasn't a major factor, but the dream was just, he was a Killer. I think he was just a peaking at that moment. And before we knew it, they were running with us. They were yeah. scoring with us. Yep. And we were looking ahead toward the Celtics, and we forgot about them, and they were playing well. 
and we just couldn't turn it on. Yeah. In yeah. seven games, and you know, when they won a game, when they won a second game, boy, did they get confident. Yeah. And we just gave them that confidence. By in my opinion, we kind of kind of overlooked them a little bit. Yeah. But we didn't make that mistake again. No. So we we came back the next year, and now we now we're talking about in '87. And, and I'm gonna skip it a little bit, but we we win in '87. And then we out, you know, we celebrating, you know, we're in the foreign park, park lot, you know, and we all just yeah. chilling, we got our shades on, we got our shirts on that says world champions on it and everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, MT up there taking his shirt off, trying to show his muscles and we do, we doing our thing, you know, magic is getting the crowd all going. And then Rouse comes up to make his speech. And, uh, you know, I, I remember all of us just that, kind of sitting there clever, or standing there really. And Rouse says, you know, I guarantee everybody here that we're going to win it again next year. And then he turned around and looked at us, and we was like, what the hell did he just say? Yeah. I I had quite a bit to drink that night. <laughs> so Is it because of what he said? Or I, because? Nah, it was a celebration. <laughs> so I had to take a double. I had to take a double. I said, did he just say we're guaranteed to win it again? And, you know, here I am thinking my first championship – I'm going to take me about six weeks off, and chill, <laughs> get fat, <laughs> relax. But, you know, looking back, he knew what he was doing. He sure did. Because winning one championship was just normal uh, to the Lakers. Yeah. You know, they won in 80, 82, Two, yep. 85. And I think our best yep. team was 87. And back-to-back -back hadn't been done in 19, 20 years. Right, so right. I think he had been thinking about that. Cause I didn't think it just popped in his head. No, I bet you he thought about after we won uh, in Boston that what can I do to motivate these guys? Uh, they're very successful. They're the team of the '80s. They've already succeeded in the '80s. What can I do? And he knew we would be up to that challenge. Yeah, most guys yeah. you say guarantee they might say, "Oh man, forget that." <laughs> but us, our unit was so tight, and we monitored each other you know, very well constructively. Right. That we thought about it. We sulked for a second. And then after about three days, we we're like, yeah, we, you damn we right. We're, yeah. we're, we're that fucking good. Yeah. We're we can good. Do this. We can so, do this. so we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And, and that was our motivation again. And we just came out hungry, focused, uh, didn't let much distract us, you know, and we stayed on it and we grinded it out and, you know, Got the job done against a, a really good defensive physical team, uh, the Detroit Pistons. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember when he did that, I was the same. I was just kind of shocked. And I was like shocked and mad. I was shocked that he would even say that I was mad because I was like, man, we we can't even enjoy this one. No. You know, you done, you done made this guarantee and we trying to enjoy this one. But then, like you said, when I got home, I thought about it a couple of days. And I remember saying, you know what? I can't take that vacation. I got to start getting ready yeah. now to try to win this thing again. Yeah. And you're right. This, it wasn't something that Riles just did off the top mm -hmm. of his head. You, Riles was very calculated. Mm -hmm. he, he thought about this for a while, mm -hmm. you know, he, and he just wanted to, you know, unleash it to us at the right time. And that was the perfect time where yeah. our guards were down. Yeah. We were celebrating. We were enjoying everybody and everything. We were enjoying all these fans out there. And then when he said it, the fans went crazy. And we back here like, you know, what did he just say? You know, like then we went home. It, it was, I remember going into camp that year. It was probably the best camp we've ever had because yeah. everybody was in shape. So yeah. everybody had turned that switch. And then he challenged us again with, you know what? We got to have the best record because yeah. we have to have home court advantage because yeah. we're going to be playing. We want to have every last game or every game seven here at home. And if you remember that 88 championship was probably the hardest championship because mm -hmm. we played Utah seven games, mm. Dallas seven games, Detroit seven games, and you saved the best for last. Mm. You, seventh game against Detroit physical team like you just talked about, you come out, get a triple-double, we win the championship, you get, you know, uh, MVP of the series. You know, what 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 was going through your mind during that game? Because, I mean, that game, Clever, you was rolling. It was, I, I think you had 36. You was rolling. Yeah. What was going through your mind during that game? All I was thinking about was, you know, Kareem had carried us all throughout the 80s. And 
even though he still could throw the sky hook, I knew Kareem didn't have, you know, the intensity that he once had. Mm -hmm. So I was like, in, in, in my mind, I was like, the young guys got to step up. You stepped up, and I was like, I didn't really like the way Detroit uh, identified themselves as the bad, bad boys. boys. Yeah, Because we had already played against the Celtics. So right. it wasn't like they could, didn't have much. They were just a little bit arrogant. Rodman and Sally. And so I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that type of competition. So, you know, I just knew it was time to do my thing. Right. That's all I mean. It wasn't no, <laughs> it wasn't no, you know, wasn't no deferring. It wasn't no thinking. It was just playing the game. And playing against those guys, you have to play hard yeah. every minute, or else they'll they'll eat your lunch. Yeah. And so I remember having to start with, you know, wide low Rick Mahoney. You oh know, yeah. Six eight. Couldn't get around. Two sixty. You know, physical. And then after he go out, then he comes Spider. Mm -hmm. You know, Got shot blocker, long. I gotta deal with him. And then lastly, here comes the worm. Dennis Robinson. So I love that. I yeah. love that competition because you, if, if you ain't, if you're not ready, it's it's going to be embarrassing. And I just wanted to beat them. Yeah, they thought they were, you know, they, they just thought they were, you know, bad boys. I didn't like that. <laughs> I didn't like bad boys. Hey, Clever, I'm, I'm gonna go back to a story. If y'all really listening to this man, he he enjoyed the competition. You know, he he loved that that challenge. And I remember this in Phoenix, boy, and we and we talk about one of our guys who you know passed away not too long ago, Maurice Lucas. Yeah. Big Maurice Lucas was one of the most f intimidating guys in the NBA back in the day because at that time it wasn't no <laughs> you know flagrant fouls. You got to understand, you can get the shit beat out of you by these guys, yeah. and it just be a regular foul. You know, if ain't no blood, that chick you say no yeah. blood, no foul. You just keep on going. So I remember this one incident where Big Mo hit hit you so hard, Cleb, in your back, and you turned around and you squared up, and Mo said, "Yeah, go ahead and swing." Go ahead and swing. And you said, no, nah, I ain't going to swing, but I'm going to beat your ass yeah. every time I get to basketball. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, Magic, as smart as he was, he threw the ball to you like the next 10 times, and you just yeah. destroyed him. Yeah. I mean, so I, I'm, I'm just trying to get back to that competitive nature and that, that fierce competition that you enjoyed and how sometimes, you know, certain guys would just turn that switch on you and you yeah. would just go off. I mean, yeah. is that something that you were just born with or did it – come about when you got to the NBA or in college or what? I think I think I think I, I picked it up in college a little bit. Uh you know, playing against Duke and and Ralph oh, yeah. Sampson, oh, yeah. and, you know. You know, when you go to college, the older guys, they they going they going to test you. <laughs> right, they right. They going to talk trash, see if you are weak, see if you you know, oh, we can't we can't joke with him. I was always ready. And with Big Mo, um and I love Mo. I love yeah. Maurice Lucas. Yeah. Good brother, man. Uh, rest in peace. But he was an enforcer, man. And he would try. He would try you just to see if you were, you know, uh, weak or whether you're going to respond. So I was going to fire him because he, <laughs> that hurt, man. <laughs> he, he hit you with a cheap shot, back, hard man, boy. Like, okay, all right. He said, "Go ahead." I'm like, "Okay." I said, "No," and I forgive me for saying this. I said, "I'm gonna fuck your fat <laughs> ass up." <laughs> exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you and went said, to work on him. I, I went to spin it on him. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and that's I, I never I never had any problems out of Maurice after that. <laughs> I love it, Clever. Yeah. I love it. I think he respected that. I oh, said, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm, he respected that. Yeah, like I you said, it. you know, guys like that, they look for you to back down. If you don't back down, then they like, you know what, I gotta respect him. And, and you definitely got that respect for me. But I want I want to ask you about, and we, we talked about him a little bit. Uh, I, I still think as much as he pushed our buttons, you know, Pat Riley, uh, I, I got a chance to play for Riles for a number of years just like you. I got a chance to play for Larry Brown, who I who I consider one of the, one of the best coaches I've mm -hmm. ever played for, mm -hmm. a North Carolina guy as well. Mm -hmm. But what, 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 do you, what do you think of Pat Riley? When you think about his body of work, what he did for us, you know, what comes to mind? He, he was brilliant. You know, Pat, was, Pat had a brilliant mind because he thought a lot. You know, if he didn't, if he didn't quite know exactly, he would think about it like in depth, or he would read about it, or he would always, you know, understand personalities. That was one of his major assets. Yes, you know, yes, he understood how he could push players, how far he could push you. There was this story that went around, and he come in, he come in at halftime one time, and like. 
fucking Byron Scott. And we traded Norm Nix for you. Blah, 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 blah. Worthy. You're worthless. I don't know what they call you. Magic. I don't know. There's nothing mystical about you. And he looked at Kareem. He looked at Kareem and said, oh, Kareem, what would you like to do? I mean, I mean he, just, he, he knew who to push and who not to push. And he knew when you needed it. Yes. And, yeah. you know, uh, I just, preparation, man. I've never, I mean, I, I played for a college coach that was prepared. But Pat was prepared, man. And to Every the point day. where his preparedness sometimes turned into some of the most intense practices. Oh, my God. And, you know, I, I love Pat Rowley. You know, yeah. he, he, was, he was a good coach. He was like us. He was kind of like learning Along the way, we mm -hmm. were learning one another. He was learning how to be a coach. Tough as nails. Mm -hmm. Tough as nails. Sometimes you didn't want it. Sometimes you didn't like it. But he always kind of knew how to push you. Yeah. He got the he got he got, he the, got the most out of, out of us. Yeah. Boy, I got to tell you, our practices were like, Oof. <clears throat> man. It was like, it was like, uh, it was like you know, murder. You know, yeah. it was like blood and the guys were just physical. It was like football practice. Yeah, we, we trying to kill each other. It was like football practice. I used to hate when we had a game on Monday and we don't have another one until Friday because that meant <laughs> Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah. it, it's going to be some fighting going on because, you know, we, we play and practice so hard. I couldn't wait for games because games were easy. Yeah, it was easy. C compared to our practices, games were easy. So I used to love the fact that we had four games in five nights. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, we weren't going to have no practice at all. Yeah. We were just going to be playing basketball it, games. It motivates you one way or another. Yeah. You, not, you, you, you would like it sometimes. Sometimes you hated it. You remember the time we flew all the way back? I don't know where it was from. Was it oh, Detroit? Oh, yeah. And yeah, we landed. Like, was it oh, Detroit? I, I think it was Detroit or Boston. It, it was, was somewhere, somewhere in the East Coast. We landed after playing a game the night before. Yeah. yeah. And he says, call your wives <laughs> and your girlfriends, whoever the hell's picking you up, and tell them don't come and pick you up. Because we took a bus to the forum. I remember this. And he made us put on knee pads. He made us put on knee pads, man. I felt like I was and, in the seventh grade. And we practiced and hard. And we practiced. You remember the time we had practice? We, we had a shoot around, and shoot arounds are not supposed to be practice. Shoot around, you're supposed to come in, get your shots up, walk through the opposing team that you're going to play, walk through their plays, you know, the four or five plays that they're going to run on a consistent basis. You're going to walk through them, and, you know, you're going to figure out how you're going to guard them. And then you normally you go in and you watch the tape, right? Yeah. I remember one time Pat Riley told Kareem, take your sweats off because we about to run. And Kareem was like, I can't. He's like, why not? He said, because I ain't got nothing on but a jock. <laughs> <laughs> I can't take my sweats off because I, I ain't got nothing on but a jock. So you don't really want me to take my sweats off. So Cap had to run in his sweats. But that's how Pat Riley was. Like, yeah. like, like you just said, Clever, is that, you know, if he was pissed off or he thought we were slacking, yeah. he was like, I'm going to bring y'all back down to earth and let y'all understand what this is all about. And, and then that too, we, we, you know, we were, we were an experienced team. We were always kind of, you know, even kill. But a lot of times, I think Pat would, like, run out of stuff because, <laughs> you know, Kareem, you know, we came from great universities and great right. basketball programs. And right. So we kind of knew how to motivate ourselves. I think sometimes he would run out of stuff, and then he was just like, ah, I'm going to piss him off. <laughs> That'll work. Because <laughs> he knew if he pisses off, yeah. we would play harder. That's right. And, 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 and like you said, he he knew, he knew the pulse of yep. our team. Yep. That's for sure. He did. So, Clever, you got some great names up in Staples Center with that jersey retired, yours being one of them. How does it feel, though, to be up there with, you know, with Wilt, you know, Baylor, <sighs> Jerry, Cap, you know, now, you know, Kobe, the late, great Kobe. Yeah. Magic, how does it feel for your, your jersey to be up there? Because it obviously tells yeah. what you've had. You've had a great career in that purple yeah. and gold. Yeah, and, and that's where my life story really, you know, starts. It's like I was a mama's boy, B. <laughs> my brothers were eight, nine years older than me. I, I didn't want to do anything but go to church and, you know, stuff like that. But then my, my parents worked a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, they worked a lot. There were times I didn't see my parents till like nine o'clock at night. You know, I was a true latchkey kid. Like mm -hmm. I really had the safety pin with the key. And so I I wanted to like I, I heard the word scholarship in like the seventh or eighth grade at the boys' club. I was just playing around and Mr. Mm -hmm. Perry said, Oh, you might get a scholarship. 
And I was like, I got a fucking C average. I'm like, I know I am. <laughs> hell, because I'm, get a scholarship I'm thinking, like I'm that. Think, you know, I'm thinking it's an <laughs> academic scholarship. I didn't even know about it. You don't get no scholarship. I, like I didn't that. Even know <laughs> about an athletic scholarship, right? So when they told me it was an athletic scholarship, I was like, really? Because I had two older brothers in college. My my parents were like breaking their backs trying to keep them in a small HSBC school, and I and that was it. It clicked. I said, I'm gonna get a scholarship. So my mom and dad don't have to work so much. Mm. So when I think about that moment in my life in the seventh or eighth grade, and then when I think about I got the scholarship, I broke my ankle my rookie year, still had my scholarship, didn't even think about the NBA because they were like, we don't know what's going to happen. Right. We got two pins in there and a rod. Came back, had a subpar sophomore year, lost to Indiana, got the screws taken out, didn't know how I was going to play, had two years left, had a dynamic junior mm -hmm, year. Mm -hmm. Ralph Sampson <laughs> decides that he don't want to play with Magic and Kareem <laughs> he gonna stay in school. They really didn't need Dominique, who was a score. Mm -hmm. Terry Cummins was mm -hmm. a little better than me overall, but couldn't run the break. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I landed in Los Angeles. Then I started making an all star team, and all of a sudden, fucking Jersey's retired. Now that's something <laughs> I never, I never saw that. I never saw that. I never saw anything beyond that scholarship. That was it. So when I look up there sometime, Ben, I'll tell you another story. I took my daughters to a Britney Spears concert. I don't know what it was, but they were young. And my young, my youngest one had a friend with her. And the lights came on. And she's like, oh, there's somebody that has the same last name as you guys. And Sierra, <laughs> my youngest one, looked up and said, hey, Dad, that's someone. She had no idea I had played in the she, NBA. She, and she didn't know that was your jersey. She had no idea. So... It makes me uh, it makes me think of my parents yeah. and the people that you know this that nurture you along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a great coach, had some good teachers. So when I look up and I I see that, I never thought in, in a million years that that would happen. But it's a credit to listening to people, working hard, and just being true to yourself, yeah. man. That's all you can do when you wake up in the morning. Everything else is a bonus after that. Yeah. So it, it 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 feels good that I had people who appreciated what I did, and that they thought enough to 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 do that. Well, I tell you what, you 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 uh, been able to transfer from being an NBA player to now talking about NBA players. Ain't that something? <laughs> and especially the Lakers, you've been with Time Warner for now a while. Tell me how that transition went, Clever, because I know because I I've been on there with you. You yeah. know, it, it's it's a great show. You do a fantastic job. Gita is such a great guy. Yeah, I yeah. love Gita, man. He's, he's such a – matter of fact, I'm going to be calling y'all because I want to be back on there for a Come little on. bit. But I'm going to be calling you. But, but, but kind of tell us how that transition went. You know, um, I always wanted to do radio because somebody told me I had the face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was voice, Club. I thought it was No, nah, they said I had the face for radio. <laughs> I used to listen to this guy, Calvin, and all that jazz. So I was like – I started out majoring in communication because I just wanted to like DJ and just also, you know, get into, you know, buying small AM stations. A friend of mine was into that, but it was Sue Stratton. Sue Stratton. Who used to, not only was she uh, uh, Chick Hearn's chaperone mm -hmm. uh, all those years on the road, she was the first female uh, sports producer right. in LA. Right. And, and Stu Lance, uh, had to miss a game, and uh, the team was in Denver. So I flew to Denver. I did the game with Chick Hearn. I think I got to say maybe four words, <laughs> and they were "yep, yep," and "yes, sir." And uh, and then I just kind of I just kind of fell into it. You know, Fox uh, started a station, Fox mm -hmm. Sports Net. Mm -hmm. I got to audition for that. I got that job working with Kevin Frazier at the time. Yep, yep. And it just kind of, you know, snowballed into. KCAL 9 picked up 30 games or so. I was working with Jim Hill and Alan Massengale. And yeah, so yeah. Uh, then I took a then I took a, a broadcasting class uh, with uh, uh, Bob, um, the voice of the Kings. Oh, okay. Uh, he had a, a workshop because I sucked at it at the, be at the beginning. It was I was just horrible at it. 
And then I start to understand, you know, how to how to just do your own thing. Right. And right. formulate, you know, packages. Package for that, package for that. So it's it's been fun, man. It's uh I love talking about the game, especially the Lakers, mm-hmm. and you know, telling why something happened as opposed to what people see. Because the people see a highlight. And they'll say, oh, man, he messed up, but it might not be. Right. So I, I right. love dissecting and breaking it down. So it's been fun. Lake, yeah. Laker Nations, you know. Yeah. Fun, yeah. fun, it, fun audience. Yeah, and you and Gita do such a fantastic job. And yeah, I, get you like back I over said, there, man. I, I used to love being on there with y'all because it was it was a lot of fun. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, b- before we go, Clever, I asked all my guests this last question. What one story would you love to tell that not a whole lot of people know about? Man. A story, um, well, it's not really a story, you know, but it it's true story. Like uh, when I first moved out here, um, you know, I'd lived in the dorm in college. Um, I'd never really lived by myself mm-hmm. before, mm-hmm. and in fact, when I first came, um, I, I I I lived with Mitch Kupchak for for a couple of months, mm-hmm. and then I found a. a a, a nice townhouse. Yeah. <laughs> townhouse. And you're talking about a brother that lived in a, a shotgun house. And uh, so the first night, I come home, it was about 10.30. And uh, I realized that I'd never lived by myself before. And I was scared as shit <laughs> to live in this house by myself. I checked every closet. <laughs> this is my routine every time I came in off the road. I, I had closets. I might have had two closets my whole life. And I had to check everything because I didn't have an alarm back then. It's right here on Massachusetts Avenue in Westwood. So I was, I was afraid to live by myself. <laughs> and to make matters worse, um, I had a birthday in February. I was living in this townhouse, still a little bit shaky. In fact, I had my boy come over, man, come on over, man. You want to spend the night, man? <laughs> um, someone had had sent some balloons for my birthday. Mm-hmm. So they were sitting right by the door, right? So I go on a road trip for like seven, seven days or something. So I come back home. I open the door. It's still dark in the house. I'm looking for the switch to cut the light on. And you know how balloons, when they die, they kind of just kind of <laughs> fall all over the place like that. Well, these balloons hit me before the lights came on, and I beat the shit out of them balloons. <laughs> I was swinging like a... I ain't never told nobody this story. I was swinging like a crazy lady just swinging. <laughs> ah! And when I stopped, the fucking balloons was wrapped all around me, and it was just embarrassing, man. So that's a couple things I never told anybody, but I'm one and oh against fucking birthday balloons, man. You can imagine that. You know how they, you know how they just kind of they lose their helium and they just kind of yeah, just kind of floating there a little man, bit. Man, I beat the hell out of those balloons, boy. <laughs> oh man! All right, I, I guess guys, that's we. A- we're going to end it on that note. <laughs> Be the bad. This is Off the Dribble with your boy, B. Scott. That's my boy, James Worthy. Seven-time All-Star, three-time NBA champion, Hall of Famer, college player of the year. One of my yeah. main mans. I, I love this dude, man. We're we going to have one little chip before yeah. we go. Clever, thank you so much. Throw the old balloons away after 48 <laughs> hours, boy. <laughs>